Three cameras. Holy sh So I'm here with Ryan Iwanaga, the co-founder of Cerrito Group, and uh, I would say a good buddy of mine now, yeah. after all these years. Yeah. Yeah, so um, For sure. one of the things I want to talk about, Ryan, um, today is just basically about culture. And like, I know, I mean, me being, I, didn't, I wasn't here at Cerrito from day one, but I, I was definitely one of the reasons that made my decision to join the Cerrito Group was because of the culture. Yeah. And we're seeing a lot of these companies nowadays kind of pitch that they have great culture when they're like year one and being established yeah. and stuff like that. And so I just want to kind of how you and, you know, Trap and just kind of like, are you guys as a, as, a, as a company together, just kind of how do you guys, I mean, what, what are your thoughts about culture? Culture, I think for, I think for us, culture is the most important thing. Um, I think the way that we have tried to build a company is to focus on culture and if the culture is good, then all, everything else will follow. The success of the brand, the success of agents, uh, the success of the company. I think um, our philosophy has always been to invest in the long game versus just looking at short-term, bottom-line, uh, you know, profit-driven decisions. Is to cultivate a culture, and I think really. The reason why we started Serena Group was really because I think the the environment, the brokerage culture after the late 90s and early 2000s, um, it be, had become so corporatized that what those environments were lacking was culture. And I think in no matter what industry, people want to work where they feel good and where they believe and what the company is doing and what it stands for. And I think because of the consolidation of the industry in the late 90s, a lot of that had been taken away from the agents. And so we were kind of a, a response to that. Serena Group was a response to that. So over the last 12 years, at which you've been a very big part of that, um, you know, culture has always been something that we've tried to keep at the forefront, which isn't always easy. You mm -hmm. know? When you grow to a specific size, there are gravitational forces at work that try to pull you more to the business center. Yeah. Whereas where we have always found that we do our best stuff or where we create the most meaning is always pushing the fringes and staying away from center. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's a constant battle, but I think we're right now as a company, we're really in a good place. So. Yeah, so how many agents do, do the Serena Group have now? I th we have a little bit over 300 and I want to say 25 plus. Mm -hmm. um, and we have nine locations from uh, furthest north is here in Palo Alto. Furthest south is Willow Glen in San Jose. And then we have three coastal offices in Santa Cruz County. So, so it's a pretty big footprint. So it's right. been good. Do you have um, so? Do you are, you are you familiar with Dunbar's law? Like it's a rule of one fifty. Oh yeah. Yeah. So so like basically, if you know one person, the amount of relationships that one person can really have, it kind of maxes out at kind of yeah. like that that one fifty. Yeah. Do you feel like that's something? Uh, I mean, there was a certain number where you yeah. feel like it was. Yeah, like, you know, as a matter of fact, it's interesting because I wasn't familiar with Dunbar's law, but it makes total sense because. From year probably nine through the present, the one thing that we struggled at as, or just the one thing that we struggled with as a company, especially for Chris and I, is scaling out the pop, the personability mm -hmm. that we had created that was important to our culture. Um, and really what we realized is that the biggest challenge for both Chris and I is, be, you know, we really love our people and we really want to invest in the personal relationships we have with our people and the company had grown to a certain size where that had become more and more difficult and that's kind of what the gravitational pull example that I was giving you is that you know for me and for Chris it's really the relationships you know it's mm -hmm. it's it's what I enjoyed as an agent and as a as a co-founder or owner or whatever I am you know, that's what really inspires me is getting to know people and having relationships with them. 
and um, you'd, we did get to a certain point where that was being challenged on a daily basis, right. and we still haven't figured it out, but we're trying to. Mm -hmm. You know, if anything, that's the one focus that we have as an organization right now is how do you maintain the intimacy of culture and the tightness of what, what I consider a very positive culture as we expand. Right. And that's really what we want to focus on moving forward. Yeah. I mean, each one of the offices have their own culture too, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, that's the good thing is, is that hopefully, I mean, every person, every office, every office is like a different person all in of itself. Mm -hmm. The community has a different culture. Um, I think fundamentally all the offices have a baseline similarity mm -hmm. in philosophy and belief, uh, in cultural uh, kind of vibrancy. Right. Um, each one has grown differently, but it's still at the baseline, is still the same uh, company-wise. Um, and I think that hopefully what we've tried to do is cultivate that local culture enough to where you know, um, it carries itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, but again, the challenge is, is that Chris and I, you know, it's a pretty big geographic footprint. Right. We want to be around. We want to have that personal influence, and it's not always possible. Right. Did you, when you first started off, so the first year was, what, 2006, Six. right? So, yeah. so year one, going into with, what, like 25, 30? 27. 27 yeah, ages? 27. Yeah. yeah, so describe the culture then versus... Oh, well, it was great. The great thing about that was is that if we ever had like a, you know, like a, an idea or uh, uh, somehow of a big, a big agenda uh, item, a corporate agenda, not corporate agenda, but organizational priority that we wanted to communicate and and have kind of permeate through the, the company, all we had to do is call everybody together and tell them. You know, it was a captive audience. It was yeah. under one roof. The challenge becomes when you have... 300 plus people and you're trying to communicate a, a certain cultural philosophy and you know people are so inundated with uh, emails and texting and social media that it becomes challenging you know it's a it's a bandwidth situation but um, you know I think for us when we were a smaller company we had chances really and that probably that was one of the smartest things we did is Within the first six months of opening, we had people calling us from different marketplaces, not only in Silicon Valley, but also up the peninsula in East Bay, um, South Bay, saying, listen, we want, we want to open up an office. Why don't you come? We have people that want to join. And as, as enticing and as flattering as that was, I think the best decision that Chris and I ever made was the fact that we were trying to figure out what we represented as a company. You know, we had ideas when we recruited the first original 27 people. We had basic ideas of what we stood for as an, or what we wanted to stand for and as an organization. Yeah. But once you get inside the walls, it becomes a question of, okay, well, how do you implement that? Mm -hmm. And we, we spent the first probably two or three years really trying to figure out what that meant. And, you know, I'm listening to this book right now. Um, Front Sight Focus, it's by an ex-Navy SEAL, and he's, one of his rules is uh, crawl, walk, run, right? And you have to take every, the learning cycle has to happen in that way. Like you can't, obviously, you can't run before you know how to crawl or walk. Right. And so you have to have the discipline and the patience to focus on what's needed at that basic level. And we could have very easily said, okay, we're going to open up five offices within the mm -hmm. first three years. Mm -hmm. But I think culturally we would have suffered and we were patient and, and really diligent about trying to figure out what we stood for. Mm -hmm. And I think that has served us well as we've grown. Yeah. So there's been examples of some companies that actually expand fast or yeah. quickly. So yeah. how, how, does, how does the culture suffer? Well, I think, you know, like the, the problem with the brokerage culture in the early 2000s is that because of the consolidation, you know, one or two companies would come into a local marketplace and buy up all the local brands, and then the next day expect everybody who had just been acquired to somehow adopt some new culture, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And if you, if you don't honor people's experience and you expect them to behave in a certain way, but they're, they haven't really had a choice in the matter or they haven't been able to organically grow that culture, 
you can't expect to create a place where they feel appreciated and right. supported. Then you know that's that's in I mean that's so f in in real estate years that's such a long time ago, right? Like mm -hmm. those companies still exist, and the agent today has no idea what transpired in the late '90s, typically. Right. Um, but that was the lesson that we learned, and really, what we told people when we first opened was, and we still, I think we still believe. I mean, I mean, I know we still believe it. But what we told people is that our goal isn't to be the biggest brand in the fastest amount of time, mm -hmm. right? And I think the the corporate mindset, not only in our industry but other industries, was always, you know, we want to grow. Growth is good. And you see co smaller companies always tout that they've been recognized by the Inc. Inc. magazine as one of the five fastest or mm -hmm. 500 fastest growing companies. Right. And to me, that doesn't necessarily mean that's a good thing. Right. Right. What I want to know is, are your people happy? Is it an environment where people come to work and they feel positive? Or are you growing just for growth sake? Right. Mm -hmm. And are you growing organically or is it sort of... Um, you know, is it a, is it, if, if the corporate agenda is to grow and get big and do whatever, I just wonder how, what the quality, at some point you have to shed aspects of your culture and the quality of that experience for the sake of growing. Right, so you can't have both in your... I, I think you can have both, but you have to temper it with making sure that you're always kind of returning to the why of the culture. Yeah. You know? And um, if if your why is just to grow, that that just kind of creates a different culture and attracts mm -hmm. different people, you okay. know. And we just wanted to create the why of um, just good quality real estate experience, and that's yeah. really kind of what hopefully what's happened. Yeah, you said earlier the word honor when you know culture bringing to bringing a whole bunch of people together that haven't had the chance to. Yeah. If they have, don't have time to spend with each other yet and understand each other yeah. and have that relationship and deepen those, they know how each of, each, other, each of the people work, then it's really hard to honor whatever That's right. the, the... I think, I think the one thing that we've always been proud of is, and that, the one thing that we always appreciate is that, it, you know, Chris and I don't, we, we definitely are 100% are clear that we don't know a whole lot. And a lot of the things that have been created that have served the growth of the culture and has served like the, the have have created significance within the company. Mm -hmm. Say, for instance, the one percent for good program. Those things were all agent driven. Mm -hmm. You know, those were people coming to us and saying, "Look, at I have this idea," and Chris and I being smart enough to say. Let's run with it. Like, let's check it out. Let's yeah. try it. You know, yeah. as opposed to, I think, I think the challenge of any large corporate culture is that it 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 actually, in order to keep the whole structure stable, you can't actually you lose nimbleness, right? Mm -hmm. So when people want to change or uh, bring in something new or challenge the convention what happens is is that it the the balance of whatever the structure is becomes if there's a threat that it might actually throw things off balance right. and for us it's the imbalance that actually creates the new discovery of whatever that next thing would be mm -hmm. right and that's really what excites I think both of us really is that change the constant change yeah it's interesting because now in the real estate industry itself right now we're seeing that kind of somewhat imbalanced sometimes in an industry that's always been really somewhat archaic in terms of those set in their ways yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then now we have a, a new guard or a new group of people or companies or disruptors or whatever trying to kind of change it that's change right. that and make make things a little bit more uh, change things up basically yeah yeah and you know it's funny because I, I've given it much thought I mean I, it, when I got into the business in 97 though you know we thought that the affinity, the affinity brands or the affinity movement where you had Costco offering real estate services or USAA, you know, we thought that that was sort of the, the beginning of the end. And then it was, you know, well, it was, but when Yahoo started publishing property, mm -hmm. 
there's a big uproar and that was a significant shift in our business and so we're, we've always believed that the industry is a constant threat and I think that in and of itself that's true um, but again as like Leanna said at today's meeting I think the one thing that technology cannot replace is the person at the kitchen table mm -hmm. who's with a husband and a wife making a very big decision on the you know a, a pretty significant change in their life or taking on a greater risk by purchasing a home or you know yeah their technology can't bridge that human interaction that value right um and and i think that up until someone figures out how that happens right i don't know if there's really going to be a disruption i and chris chris has actually been thinking about this as well and you know he believes that really the disruption is happening within our industry. Like, you know, maybe this might be too negative, but, no, go for it. but just the cannibalization of our business, mm -hmm. right? Like, um, you know, we've always believed in quality agents, um, thoughtful growth, um, you know, just being very careful about what we represent in the industry. And, you know, and I don't mind that there's a low barrier of entry into our business because I think it's great. Every every agent on day one has the same opportunity as everybody else, and I love that. But I think the brokerage community has to take a greater responsibility in training those people and making sure that they understand that, you know, this is a this business is a noble business. It is a hard business. It takes honesty and hard work and commitment. And I think that we do ourselves a disservice as a brokerage community when we don't instill that in our agents. Yeah. When we just hire people, you know, not really understanding whether they're going to be successful or not, just throwing up against the wall and saying who sticks. Right. That's that's right. not how you build a reputable industry, right? right? Um, I've always said this that um, I don't I don't need a haircut now. But when I'm not shaving my head, I go to a, my barber, my, you know, he's my, he's my, my buddy. And, you know, I talked to him and he had to take 1500 hours and go to barber school every day for eight hours for a whole year before he could actually then study for the state exams. And then because he's got a license, he can charge me $35 for a haircut, right? He's taking a whole year out of his life. Yeah. 1500 hours. Yeah, 1500 hours. With real estate, you could get your principal's license and take your, you know, within three months, really, or you know, within six months, and without any real schooling. And the moment you get your license, technically you're qualified to go sell a $20 million house, but do you have the basic baseline knowledge and the expertise to do that? No, you, I mean, I, I would venture to say no, right. you know? And, and so that has always really struck me as uh, a bitter irony in our industry, mm -hmm. right? Is that why don't we have higher barriers of entry? Yeah. Um, I'm all for opportunity. I don't ever want to say that one person can't do it. But I think as an industry, we do ourselves a disservice if we don't invest in our people and make sure that they understand the importance of what we're doing. Yeah. You know? So. Yeah. Uh, um, Warren Buffett does a series on CNBC and they interviewed him about, you know, because he's investing in various real estate industries, real estate spaces and companies in the, within the real estate space. And he's like, are you concerned with the red fins or the discounters? And he said, no. He said, because it's all about this. I That's mean, true. it's a personal relationship, right? And so if you have the agents that understand that and know how to do that and get better at it and do be yeah. at the top of their game. But this, it does seem like there's some sort of consolidation of the really, really good agents to become larger teams or brokerages or whatever you call yeah. it and so a lot of the other ones and you know I, I think that has a lot to do with it if you look at it statistically there I think and this was I, I read reports years back but they said that the pie of business would become smaller and the proportion of agents who actually had pieces out of that pie would shrink mm -hmm. and it really would the quality of agent would be you know, very rarely do you see a transactional based agent versus a relationship, someone who's interested in creating the relationship, right? 
you have some agents who are just focused on transaction. They don't really develop relationships with their clients, but you have really the agents that I think are around for the long run whose focus is, yeah, let's do the business, but let's develop the relationship because that's where the value of kind of the experience mm-hmm. is, right? Absolutely. And so I, I think that more and more as the business and industry becomes more and more competitive, that quality of client experience is going to be the point of differentiation. It's not going to be the number of transactions. It's going to be how the agent interacts within the transaction and the value that that agent brings, not only in knowledge, but, you know, a lot of what we do, it has to do with easing fear and reading relationships Mm -hmm. and balancing the different you know struggles that go on within the relationship or the psychology of the buyer or the seller and, right. you know trying to figure all that out and if you're just focused on the transaction you're going to miss a lot of that mm. and through my years of dealing with you know clients who are not satisfied with their experience it's ultimately you know 99.99% of the time what it boils down to is they just don't feel heard, right? And so the agent has missed kind of clues as to what they want, and they're so focused on what their agenda is. What they want. What they want. Right. And basically, all it takes is taking a moment, a breath, and listening and acknowledging, okay, this is what they want, this is what we'll do. So. Awesome. Yeah. Ryan, thanks. Yeah, man. Yeah. Cool. Peace. Thanks, man. Go fight, go fight, That was fire, man. That was all fire. <laughs> <laughs>